Harry Hess, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Man, it's a true honor to have you on. I am a huge melodic rock fan. I'm just going to say it out of the gate. You are an icon to fans of this genre all across the world. So it's just an honor to have, yeah. you, on the, have you on the channel. Thank you. Now, for our Harem Scarum fans, we're going to get into all, that, into all that soon. But up front, I wanted to touch on the new single, Never Gonna Let You Go. This is part of the first Signal project, which has been yeah. you know, on the go since, since 2010. And I love it. The new song dropped on the Frontiers YouTube channel yesterday. And man, what a belter high quality production relatable lyrics melodic and your top class vocal your output is consistently fantastic tell me about the new song um yeah you know what i was um more involved in this record than i've ever been on any of the uh first signal releases you know it originally started as a project uh that frontiers uh approached me about when when i stopped doing harem scarum and I actually can't remember what year that was. It was probably 2009 when I stopped doing the harem scarum thing. I was just really super busy with production work. And at that point, Pete and I felt, you know what? We've written these types of songs over and over and over again. And I think in retrospect, at the time we felt we had nothing more to offer. But in retrospect, I think we just needed a break, you know? Because when we first started it, you know, late... I think it was 1989 or something like that. We've literally never stopped working. And so until 2009, you know, that's a long time to be grinding away at writing songs, production, playing, and just basically nonstop. So at that point, um, you know, Frontiers approached me and said, hey, if you're not going to do the harem scarum thing, would you be interested in singing on a, on a rock project? Because, hey, we think you're a rock singer and you should be doing rock songs. And I was like, okay, cool. And so they started sending me material and I purposely wanted to stay away from the songwriting. Um, not only because I was burnt out on it, because I thought, well, now I've got the opportunity to just sit back and be a singer, which is, which is much easier um, as opposed to the standpoint of like trying to just micromanage every little aspect of making a record, which that's, the stuff that drains you that um, I really needed a break from. So I welcomed the opportunity just to sing. And then over the years, we've, you know, obviously been accumulating songs and from many other writers. But this time around, they had a, they involved me more when the songs were in their infancy. And some of them didn't even have lyrics. Some of them were just like, oh, here's a scratch vocal on top of it. Do what you want. So never going to let you go. Um that was just a musical idea that I got with a scratch vocal on it from one of the other songwriters. And I thought, you know what, let, let me just have a go at it. I'm just going to do what I think I should do on top of this. And that's what I did. And I think it worked out great. I really like the song and I'm happy with it. You're all I know. Hold on tight. Cause I'm there. with it so at least that's a unique aspect of of you know co-writing with people and i'm not even in a room with them you know like so some of those yeah. people and it's sometimes a little bit weird and embarrassing when i'm doing interviews they'll say who wrote that song or and i go i don't know because i knew at the time but not six months later i'm like i really don't know and i've never met well, it could be alessandro it could be anyone you know or, or, well or we can always bet that it's ali right yeah, yeah, that's always yeah. a good guess because ali's just on everything and He's super talented and really, really great. I, I, I get you. Look, I, lo I love the new song. I love the project. The, the music video was great. You know, your voice sounds even better than when we first heard it back in 1991. I've said it before with other singers like Steve Overland. How is this possible? What are you guys taking? Well, I'll, I'll tell you honestly, it's just, I didn't know what I was doing back then. Like, I really, really didn't. Like, I was just opening up my mouth and yelling. And my singing style then was just try and just force it out. And that's even what I did on our first two records, to be quite honest. It wasn't until that I did the demo of Slowly Slipping Away and I was working with older you know, producers or songwriters and were saying, put some breathiness into your voice, like calm down, you know what I mean? I'm listening to me Ridiculous. try to sing these songs, and now when I sing them, 
it's way more in control and refined and I know what's going to come out of my mouth before I sing and that's what that's what the difference is right now is that I actually know what's going to happen and all I can say it's just a level of control and maturity based on doing this over and over again no, I get you, but I, I I hear you. But man, I just listening to the to the vocal on the new song, I'm looking at it going nothing, nothing, nothing has changed. It's better these days. The new album, Face Your Fears, is out on February 17th, and I can't wait to get it. I collect my vinyls, you know. I call the channel Sleeve Saturday for a reason. The sleeve cover is pretty cool on the new record as well. Really interested. Yeah. Very very briefly in terms of the content, weather appetite a little bit is what we've seen on this single. Kind of thereabouts what we're going to get for the rest of the record. Um, well, I mean, this, you know, this reminds me of it. Like, I mean, I'm thinking Def Leppard when I'm working on that, you know, I'm trying to hear it. see yeah. a t-shirt. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I grew up trying to make Mutt Lang records and Def Leppard was one of my early production influences with regards to hearing like hysteria and going, holy shit, I want to, I want to do that, you know? Mm. And I've always loved bands like, that had big harmonies like Boston. And so for whatever reason, those always caught my attention growing up and I just loved vocal harmonies. And then of course, Queen was a major influence. Yeah, the record is a, a bit more heavy, a bit more aggressive. And I, I, I think, you know, melodically, it, it, it marries the two together. And that's even what I've been trying to do on the last few Harem Scam records. I want to have some weight to the songs but I want them to be singable, easy to remember, and not make it, you know, some sort of uh, exercise for the listener to have to, you know, even grasp what's yeah. going on. So I like it simple and easy, but not fluffy. So okay. that's that's the goal, at least. Uh, whether I succeed or fail is uh, in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> well, look, I'm very excited, man. I'm going to leave a link below to the to the new song um, so people can check it out. For now, um, first signal, never going to let you go. Check it out. Right, Harem Scarum. Now, this morning, I listened to your first album and your latest album, Back to Back two very different records yeah. in some ways i feel like the melodic rock tag correct me if i'm wrong but in some ways i feel like the melodic rock tag is something harem scarum have tried to shake a bit at times even as early as the mood swings record was a heavier album than the debut now what i'm getting at here is in harry hess's head your motto default to yourself do you think yourself at my core i'm more brian johnson and joe elliott than steve perry and jimmy jameson yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I mean, I probably would have answered it differently all along the way um, over the years. But in retrospect, I mean, now I'm 54 now. So when I started thinking about what Harem Scarum would be, I was a teenager, right? I mean, I wrote honestly when I was 18 years old or 17 or something like that, while I was, you know, um, you know, on the back of coming out of a metal background. Like, I mean, I grew up, they say your formative years as, as a male, you'll always love the music that you grew up listening to when you were like 14, yes. 15. You'll always hear that for the rest of your life and, and connect to it. And I think that's still true for me because if I hear an old Judas Priest track or Iron Maiden or something like that, like people have to realize that in the mid eighties, when I was a teenager, uh, just starting off, you know, trying to write songs and figure out what to do. Like that's, that stuff was mainstream. That was in the top 10 yes. at radio. So when like Bon Jovi came out with Slippery When Wet or White Snake, the big White Snake, White Snake album, that was, you know, that was mainstream radio yeah. at the time. And it's pretty wild to think about that now. So I don't know if I'm a product of, you know, that that was pop radio at that point like it's pretty mm. funny to think of it in that sense like were we just a product of what was out on you know uh out on the radio stations and and what was just in the forefront that media was kind of going hey here's music for you so i kind of grew up maybe a little bit more underground in the sense that my my friends that weren't into music probably weren't listening to Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, but mm. they obviously knew about Bon Jovi and, you know, 
uh, Journey, Def Leppard. Absolutely. And even Journey at that point was a little bit more old school. It wasn't like the cool thing at that point. <laughs> yes, it just yeah. came out that much earlier. And then, you know, to your point with Mood Swings, we we made a conscious pivot then. So everything that's on the first record is a product of everything that we learned, you know, from 13 to 19. And, you know, that was kind of that uh, window of where we wrote that first record. Yeah. No, I get you. I want to get to them a couple of records, but I just, I just, yeah. on, I just wanted to focus on on the latest one, Change Your World, just for for, yeah. for a second, if we could. Yeah. It was released in probably the worst possible time in the last fifty years. You released it in March <laughs> yeah. twenty. Yeah. I've never seen videos for the death of me and aftershock in January and yeah. February, and thinking to myself, "Holy shit, they've just gone and done it again! Incredible." I didn't care what it took. If you guys were touring this record, Canada, Japan, I was going. Then bang, the world shuts down. My question is. After all the hard work you put into it, did that album ever stand a chance? Well, no, in retrospect. I mean, like, we didn't know what was going on at the time. We had a pretty um, extensive European tour booked. We were booked to be on Sweden Rock Fest with Guns N' Roses headlining. And all of it just got shut down. And then they even approached us again about rescheduling. Then that got cancelled you know, the next round of rescheduling. And then after that, I was like, I think we're just going to have to sit this out and wait and see what happens because, you know, we're not in a position where, well, we none of us wanted to book flights, hotels, travel, do all this thing. And, and you know, I'm sure you heard lots of horror stories from bands that, you know, just got screwed, like, you know, flying yeah. out. And then all of a sudden, last minute, everything's getting canceled. So, we thought we better sit this out until it gets sorted. And uh, that was kind of our mindset after probably a year and a half of booking, canceling, booking, canceling. We're just forget it. The moment's passed yeah. almost, you know, the moment is gone, that the record is kind of come and gone. And then it's absolutely. It's and I mean, you know, and like I, I, you know, if I hear a track or see a little video clip or whatever, I go, I, I think like Death of Me and Aftershock and a couple songs on that record, is some of the best we've ever done. Yeah, and I it's agree. a real shame that, uh, you know, it kind of got lost in the whole, you know, uh, situation focused on different things. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And rightly so. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's there for people to, you know, discover, I guess, uh, as far as the legacy of Harem Scarum goes. Yeah. Well, man, it's funny you should say it's some of your best work because there are so many bangers on that record. I'll call out a few deep tracks, as I always do. I don't know with previous interviews. I'll do it in this one. In the Unknown and Know Me Without You are just absolutely class. But I want to touch upon Aftershock for a second, if I can. Now, I'm a lyrics guy. I go into, I, I do song meanings and stuff on the channel. I'm a big lyrics fan. And I love the metaphor in Aftershock. I love the metaphors of a failed love affair being the akin to an earthquake. Um, right, yeah, just, this, yeah. just this guy feeling the destruction of his life after his lover has left him. Now, I'm curious. Yeah. I'm not a songwriter. My question is, I'm fascinated where your brain goes to with themes like this. You know, without getting too personal into your own life, is this from lived in experience or seeing a broken hearted mate drown his sorrows down the pub? No, I'm. You know what? I've never really written uh, from a personal perspective. They're all just observations, and you know, um, I'm, I'm just. Yeah, I'm not that in tune with who I am to write <laughs> in that sense. You know, I'm just not. I mean, I'm. If we hung out, um, I'm probably never going to talk about your music, although I could all day long. But just at this point in my life. I'm more interested in other things and talking about things that I know nothing about because it, they seem interesting to me. And right. that, I just go, I've learned a craft, I think, you know, and we, we did it wrong for so many years or we'd have to stumble upon it. But I think as far as what Harem Scarum is and what it should sound like with regards to what a fan thinks it is, we've only come around to that in the first, like in the last three records. And I think... 
you would you would notice that because I think if you say, well, what is harem scarum? And we've asked ourselves this many times, especially when we start from scratch with a bank blank slate. You're you are who you are, and whatever yeah. your ideas are, I think everybody's music is a product of who they are. But also, the most important thing about it that people overlook is that you have to be your own worst enemy with regards to.、Um, Not own worst enemy is a bad way to phrase it, but you you have to police your own material as if you don't like it because that's your job is to find fault with it. And so when I start working on anything, even when I'm producing other people's records, I'm constantly poking holes at and trying to find what I don't like about it. So it's really only my personal taste. I have no scientific evidence to back up that this is a good song or a bad、right. song. I'm just telling you what I think, and if you're on board with me, then we're going to make this kind of a record. So every song that you hear is just like, I like it. That's it. And when I'm writing it, I just go, Would a harem scarum fan like this? And I do think about that because.、Right. I'm not just making these for me anymore. And there were points where we were like Voice of Reason. That's just us, like just doing whatever the fuck we want, you know. Yeah. But a record like the last one, or United, or the one before it, we're like, let's let's write something that we know this kind of a fan would like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so. That's what this is, but it's it's your taste. Well, I love what you bring to it lyrically. I love where I love where you take us on that. Whether it's from lived in experience or not, I love where、mm-hmm. you take it. Look, you mentioned Pete. Yeah, and I'm going to stay on Aftershock for a second.、Yeah. His guitar solo on Aftershock is insane. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm picking up on some Tin Lizzy, Gary Moore, borderline Celtic vibes on that solo. I'm way way off because I'm feeling it. Well, yeah, I mean, you'd have to ask him, but I mean, like a lot of times, we're just given that moment with you know the the song structure and chord structure, and you know if you've listened to、uh, some of our other stuff, like we'll we'll take it on a weird tangent just so it's something interesting. Maybe it's not the smartest thing to do with regards to keeping everybody focused and you know、uh, on the right track, but. As musicians, we try to, you know, keep ourselves entertained as well, and maybe a, a, like a weird key change or even tempo.、Um, we we've always been big on cut time things, like when you know、uh, different instrumental pieces come. So we'd either go to a bridge, or we'd go to a breakdown, or we'd go to a weird instrumental part that leads into a solo. So all those things are just. Things you learn along the way that you like to do to keep the song interesting, you know. And then so Pete has his space, and you know he works really hard on the solos to to try and create something unique to him and this a signature for him. So for fans of Harem Scarum that love his guitar playing,、um, it's always a, a great moment in the song when you get to hear whatever the fuck it is that he thinks fits there. So that's what so, we do.、Yeah. He's so good. He is、yeah. so, man. He's just so good. Look between you and Pete, you know, in, in melodic rock and melodic hard rock, you have some incredible singer songwriter. Guitarist duos, let's say Lou Graham and Mick Jones, Steve Overland and his brother Chris, Jim Peterick and Frankie Sullivan,、uh, Steve Perry and Neil Sean. I wanted to delve a little bit into your relationship a little bit with Pete. You mentioned you kind of went into a little bit. You guys are a formidable team since you first formed the band. What's the dynamic like between you? Are you pals as well? Yeah, we. I mean, we used to hang out all the time because all we did was work together. You know, so、um, over the years, you know.、Um, You know, when I had kids, probably I mean, my kids are twenty three and twenty five. You know, so、wow. you know that that gets you、uh, on another track, and so you know, yeah, there was a little less hanging out going on year in year out, and and now、uh, like with COVID and everything like that, we would just be FaceTiming when we'd be working together. You know, like I think you know I I. Got in a room with him, maybe I don't know, ten times over the last you know、uh, couple of years. That's it, you know. So, but but we talk a lot. We don't really work that much、uh, 
together anymore. We probably work on other people's projects more than we do on our own stuff because, you know, we're just not that motivated at, at the moment to to get in there and, and, and do the same thing over and over again. We kind of have to push each other and drag each other along. Mm-hmm. And I've always been the kind of personality that, that drives it, you know? So I would just say, Hey Pete, I'm coming over tomorrow and we're going to work and we do that. But if I didn't do that, we probably wouldn't. And so, you know, we, we probably just hang out and go out for lunch. You know what I mean? Before <laughs> we would do anything. And uh, so that, that's a weird spot where we're in right now. And that's why we haven't, we haven't written a song really since um, the change of world record. Mm. You know, for for a couple of reasons, and but but one of them really is is like, do we want to take this on again? Like when you s- stare at, you know, a blank page, and you've got the history of what you've done, and so you know you got to do something like that. But like, how would that riff go in E or A or G? How like what on earth would you do that wouldn't be either so fucked up that nobody would like it, but it might be yeah. entertaining to us. Or you do something very similar to what you've done before. We've done a million up-tempo songs in E. We've done a million mid-tempo songs. And we've done a bunch of ballads as well. And so when you dissect all those things and if you were to play them all, uh, there's a common thread going through it. And if you want to continue that common thread, you really run the risk of repeating yourself. So that's kind of where we're at with it. So we need to figure out a way to either get motivated to just do the work or we find a little angle that excites us to kind of approach the next one. I find it interesting how sometimes, you know, somebody is talented as you and, and, and Pete can almost, I'm kind of almost sniffing. And I don't correct me if I'm wrong, but almost a sniff of kind of a crisis of confidence between the two of you to, to, to do something different, but like Bono and the edge and Richards and Jagger, they have a sound. The sound is the sound. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. be, you know, I don't know if you're kind of aware of that, that, that maybe it's in your heads as well. We are repeating ourselves, but don't, all duos like that just have a sound and it is what it is. And they they do. They do. It's just that when you're writing it, um, uh, look, I'm just conscious of like not boring us and then not boring the listener. And I just picture someone listening to it and go, yeah, it's the same old, same old, you know, and look, you're going to get that anyway. And exactly. honestly, we don't, we don't give a shit if we like it, like we just have to like it. And then, I believe that of any band or any fan base, you go like, if, if I like a band and I mean, maybe it's not their best work or whatever. Um, I'm still happy that they did it and I'm happy to listen to it. And I might say, Oh, I like this better or that early thing better. Um, but I'm just happy that they're continuing and doing what they do. And, and so we're, we're at a real, like a kind of a weird stage in our lives where we just need to decide whether we we're still doing this or not. And if we're doing this, we want to, we want to do it great. Like we've always tried to be better than the last one. And that gets harder and harder every time. And the minute that we feel that we're not, um, that's probably when we're, we're not going to hear another song from us because we just will think it's not good enough to play for anybody, even I though understand. fans might like it. You know what I mean? So we have to figure that out. But, I understand. but we're a little, little lazy now, too. I'll, I will admit that. We're a little lazy. It's it's nice just to sit on the couch and watch Netflix after 30 years of plowing away and trying to get, you know, somewhere right. in the music biz. Look, I want to... Okay, for a second, I just want to go back to that and we've, you've, you've talked about it a little bit but I kind of want to focus the question a little bit I want to go back to that self-titled debut record from 1991 I mean man what an album hard to love with a little love slowly slipping away love reaction we all know it any fans watching this know that wow track after track it's a masterpiece in my opinion now we've touched upon the Mood Swings album and I will in a second again which went a bit harder that was a conscious choice obviously my question is though what is your relationship like with that first album now in 2022? Um, I mean, I would never really listen to it. And I mean, like, I, I would say this about all of our <laughs> records. Um, <laughs> you know, when you've lived it, when you're making it, 
again, you're playing devil's advocate all the time. And by the end of it, I remember I tell this story a lot. I go, because when bands get freaked out or they're finishing their record or whatever, I remember laying on the couch at the studio when we were just finishing mixing that record in 1990 or 91. And I looked at Pete and I said, Pete, I think this is the biggest piece of shit I've ever heard in my life. And I mean it. I swear to God, I said that and I really felt it. I was so mortified and dejected about wow. what yeah because i was just like it all sounded out of tune to me it sounded out of time this was don't forget our first six records maybe there's no auto tune there's no digital workstation where you can even visually see it mm. you, everything we did we had to play right and yes. i remember the producer we worked with kevin doyle who was awesome you know he had worked with Hall and Oates and Kiss and just came off the Atlanta Miles album that sold like fucking 10 million records. And is that all? Yeah. And so he was just like, yeah, you're 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 out of tune. You're out of time ahead. You're playing behind. And like so he got us in the mindset of like really digging in and learning our craft and getting better at it. But when but when you don't know and you're trying to learn on the fly, it really fucks with your head and you're trying to figure out how to make records. Cause we really had never worked with somebody of his level. And, and now in retrospect, I listen to slowly slipping away and I go, I'm amazed that it's that good for guys it's that so have good. no idea what they're doing, you know, all the backing vocals and the arrangements and everything like that. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm really proud of it. And especially like, like I said, I mean, I know who we were, 12 months before we made that record and our demos were just terrible. Right. You know, and then we made that record and it re like Kevin really elevated us to the next level and got us to care about how we're playing, how to make a record, even teaching me how to record, you know, like I, I owe my engineering skills and production skills to Kevin Doyle. And, and he was just really giving with his time. Um, sometimes he turned around and just like, look at me and just like, let me work, you know, like shut up because I'd always be asking, why are you using that preamp? Why are you EQing it like that? What's up with that compressor? Don't you think we might try this? And I just drive him crazy. But that was me trying to figure this out and learn. And then I applied a little bit more every time we made a record. I got better at that. And then eventually just started engineering and mixing and, you know, us producing our own records. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, like with everything that you make, you have a bit of a love hate relationship, but it's been so long since we made that record. I don't even remember the guy that made it, you know, like I, I don't remember who I was at that time. All I remember was just being very confused about the process, not really understanding. I like, was like, will this sound good? I remember playing TNT intuition for Kevin Doyle, I go, I want it to sound like that. I really like this sound, you yeah. know? And yeah. I'm just kind of going like, oh, okay, well, we can do that. I'm like, really? I don't think so, but okay. You know? Yeah. 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 No, I get you. Like, it's funny because you're talking about your lived-in experience of it, and you know, but there's fans like me of Harem Scare who treasure that record, you know? So, But it's, you know, I get it. You lived in it. Look, you know, when I started this YouTube channel, my editing was shit. My friends and yeah. my mother told me it was great. Now I look back and I go, what the hell were them videos? They were borderline unwatchable, you know? So it kind yeah. of, you know, I, 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 I understand. It is. It's an evolution and you never feel like you've arrived anywhere. I mean, mm. you just, you know... There's no guarantee that, again, to my point earlier, there's no guarantee that if Pete and I write a song tomorrow and record it, that it's going to be any good. But the most important thing is if if I feel it isn't good, then I'm like, what what's the point at this time in our lives mm. of putting out anything that we don't feel is as good, if not better than anything we've done before? We've just done too much that I don't like that I would say there's no point in doing anything that that we feel is just isn't great, you know? So. I, I I understand. Look, the the record is riddled with angst, lost love, and I love the upbeat sonics uh, of a song like Hard to Love, juxtaposed against the heartbroken lyrics. Then there's yeah. just out, out love songs like Slowly Slipping Away, you mentioned it. Um, now, you kind of answered pre-answered one of my questions earlier on, because I was looking at that. Some of these are quite deep lyrically, and it's full of love angst, and I was going to ask you, how does a 20-year-old come up with those kind of, kind of lyrics? Because at 20, I was down the pub with my pals, not thinking about uh, yeah. girlfriends. 
I, and you know, if I'm being honest, I mean, we're just repeating words that we've heard in other songs and trying to put together catchy phrases. And, you know, when you're writing a song, it's kind of half like, you know, all of your influence is coming together, but hopefully with a unique idea that you're bringing to the table. So, you know, if you listen to a lot of pop lyrics today or even all along the way, I mean, they're not usually saying something earth shattering, you know, there True. isn't. There isn't a Don Henley message in there. Like when I first heard <laughs> End of the Innocence, uh, you know, yes. uh, Part of the Matter and stuff like yes. that. That was the yeah. first time I really went, wow, I got to really step up the old lyric game. But then, you know, at that point, Don Henley's already been through how many Eagles records. He's an older guy at that How point. many wives? <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. And, and compared to where I am. And plus, you know. He's a smart guy that can put together some sentences that make sense that make you think. And and now he can marry that together with some sort of melody, great chord structure. And that's where the two worlds collide. And when you can do that, you've got a great song. Easier said than done. Right. You know, yeah, because that simple message. But it's but it's meaningful over the backdrop of some interesting or great music like some of the songs, you know, there are three chords and there's nothing interesting about that. But but it's the lyrics and the melody that make it work. And then there's other songs that are, it's all about the riff and the cool vibe that music's giving you. So that's what this song's about. And then you just kind of put the, those pieces of the puzzle together and make something that you think is, is good and interesting. So I just wish that whatever we did, if you look at every record we did, if it just came out three years earlier, yes, uh, you know, you'd be, We'd be doing this on a beach in Maui right now. But, you know, we were a little bit one step behind, but, but it was our age, right? I mean, you know, we we couldn't, it was already tough enough to make the first record when we were like 19 and the songs that were on those records, we wrote when we were like 17, 18, whatever. Um, you just don't, you just can't be good enough at that point to, to to compete with everybody else in the world. And so it's just, we're a product of our age and our time. And then, you know, we started on this journey of making records and it just so happened to fall into a time where it was very disruptive with what happened with melodic rock versus grunge and then everything that came after. Absolutely. Where did the album's art cover come from? You know what? We just, uh, we, we had a meeting with, um a, a designer and he just kind of looked at the name and went how's this and we were like perfect okay cool like we never really cared too much about anything other than like what we were doing like you know if we were writing songs or we were playing that's what we cared about that's what we were focused on we were talking about like artwork, poster, other things that were in the peripheral of of doing what we needed to do, even videos we we couldn't give a shit like you know like we really couldn't we were just like no you're never a band that you don't come across as a band ever even when you were younger to take yourself too serious you never get that like no and and even if it looked that way we never were i mean that we had the goofiest photo sessions i mean it never it, it maybe even came across way more serious than it really was and we we took the music seriously, but never took ourselves seriously. And I can say, like, nobody in the band ever had an ego. I mean, nobody. And we couldn't take ourselves seriously. And if one of us did, the other one would be reminded. Keep you in check. Us, oh, think. absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah just constant yeah. digs at each other, constant cutting each other up. Nobody could have an ego uh, uh, in, in our little circle because it just wouldn't be possible. It wouldn't fly with the other guys. <laughs> I get your very, very last bit on the debut record. Look, the epic ballad, honestly. Now, we've already talked about Harem Scarum sonically being on the higher side of melodic rock and a harder end of melodic rock. That's where you prefer it to be. But in this one, it's an out-and-out piano ballad. Nearly 15 million streams on Spotify, 6.5 million views on YouTube. With all the rock material you've released in the, in, you know, over the decades at this point, right up to the latest record, does it piss you off that this song sits top of the tree for the casual listener? Yeah, I mean, it, it's especially like, yeah, with the casual listener, because there's still people that just know, because Slowly Slipping Away and Honestly and um, a little bit No Justice, but not really. It was really the first record, because like we discussed, the timing of it, the, that's what people remember. Like in Canada, if anybody even remembers Harem Scarum in Canada, it's that that's what they remember. So right. um, nobody would even connect me with 
that thing and that guy, right? Yeah. And I don't yeah. mention it to anybody. So it was always somebody else going, hey, you know that guy there? That was that guy in Harem Scarum. And I'm just like, holy shit, yeah. But, but yeah, so you're right. And, and just so you know, and some people listening might not be aware, but the reason that song is still so popular to this day, it, it actually was a number one in the Philippines and, and lots of uh, areas in, in Asia. And so we had a gold record in the Philippines. We we're the first gold record in Warner history in the Philippines uh, 30 years ago. And because that song was a number one, and then right after it, Something to Say, the other ballad was a number one. And yes. so they kept telling us, oh, they love the ballad, you know, in Asia and, and specifically in, in the Philippines. Um, then there was like Filipino Idol and X Factor and stuff. And all the contest contestants would always sing that sing song. It. Right. Oh, okay, yeah. right. So if you go on to YouTube, you can find... Right. Filipino idol, like singing honestly. And then some girl that won, put it on her record. So she wins Idol or X Factor, puts it on her record. Then the song goes number one again, like 10 or 15 <laughs> years later. She has right. a gold record with it. And so it's a funny little history of this song. And if we go anywhere in the world and, and we run into anybody that's of Filipino heritage, we go, hey, do you know this song? <laughs> So we go to the Philippines for the first time about four or five years ago, and we'd run into people like, and just for a joke, we'd say, hey, do you know this song? We'd sing a little bit of it. And they go, oh yeah, yeah, hear them, scare them, honestly. We go, oh, okay, cool. And we'd, we'd just walk away. Wouldn't mention, right. we don't look like the people that did it. They had yeah. no clue, but just for our own entertainment, we'd love to see if people 30 years later, just on the street would know the song, and they do. So that's our claim to fame. Right, well, I'm with your Filipino fans because I adore it. I think it's a great song. I absolutely love it. Of all the big hair of any rock band of that genre, yours was the most powerful. I mean, it was the biggest. It was the best. It was incredible. It was incredible. Will, will we ever see a return to it? Absolutely not. I don't think there's <laughs> enough love. I mean, compared to what it was, it was insane. But you know what? That was natural. So good. It wasn't yeah. even like, that was just natural curl and... Uh, yeah, I'd get into an elevator with a bunch of old ladies and they'd all be tugging at my hair. Like, people liked it. It was hilarious. But, you so know. Good. And you had Judge, Ryan, Judge Beverly Hills Reinhold in your music video. What's all that about? Well, that's right. He was a friend. Uh, the guy that directed the video was doing some sort of feature film where Judge Reinhold was in it. And <laughs> the lady that plays the mother is... I, I need to get this right. She She's an actress in her own right, but she is Kiefer Sutherland's mother. Oh, come on. Yeah. And so Judge Reinhold, I, I guess he was working with this uh, video producer and they were, and he was like, oh, I'm making this video in Canada. Um, would you like to be in it? And I guess he was like, yeah, sure. I'd love to be in it. And so we, were, we never met him, never talked to him, just, you know. It all happens separately. So good. Like, okay, cool. Again, so random, but so great. Yeah, we're so ridiculously, like, not involved in any of that. We're like, yeah. I remember that whole thing. Like, we were, we thought, we should maybe go to the final edit and at least see, like, what's in it. Like, you know, maybe we don't like <laughs> a few shots. And they were just like, nah, it's fine. And we're like, okay, it's fine. That's brilliant. Look, I'm going to throw up a little quick clip of uh, Honestly here. Um, check it out. Sure. Okay, the cool uh, retro album to love, the cool album to love if you're a Harem Scarum fan. We've done a lot now on the previous album, but the cool one is obviously Mood Swings, and I love it. Look, I genuinely love it. And I know you and Pete fondly remember it too. No Justice, Sentimental Boulevard, and the epic Stranger Than Love. I mean, come on. I'm um, sorry if I'm fanboying it here too much. What I like, what I like about you is that, from reading a bit into you, is that you 
you kind of put your money you earned from the success back into the music and you reinvested it in, in, in your own studio. Very clever. A lot of rock stars piss it up against the wall. 20 years after its release, you re-recorded it. A lot of fans will know that anyway. And you've done the Mood Swings 2 in, in 2013. I'm assuming this was as much to have the rights to the material as we, as as opposed to the sentimental value. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, for people that don't know, whoever pays for the record owns it. And when you have a record deal, a record company's paying, giving you the money to go make the record. So in those situations, uh, we're the songwriters. Nobody takes that away from us, but... They happen to be, or those songs happen to be on a record that somebody else paid for. And so they own that physical record. Yep. It's well within our rights to go ahead and re record those songs again. And that's why you see a lot of artists do that. I think Taylor Swift has been doing that now for a few years because, yes. you know, someone else owns her records. And that's just the way it works. And that's fine. We have no issues with it. We, we get along great with the Warner uh, company. There's still people there from 30 years ago that um, I, I you know still deal with on other matters and even with Harem Scarum. Um, so, for instance, I'm, I'm going to get permission from Warner to reissue the Mood Swings record on vinyl because it's never come out on vinyl, the oh, original Mood cool, Swings. Man. So I'm, I'm doing that right now. And so I'm going to remaster that record and reissue it on vinyl and probably do, you know, a run of like, you know, three to five hundred or something. And we're going to do some never done before acoustic tracks that we did on that, you know, from the Mood Swings era and put together a little package of, you know, that kind of uh, celebrates that record in that era and get it out there. Because that's another one. Like I have the vinyl actually around the room in here from the. Uh, Frontiers releases and now somebody recently just released the first record on vinyl that had nothing to do with us somebody you know anyone can actually go and do that if they get permission from the record company so right. we signed off on it we said yeah sure it's, it'll be cool for fans to have if they want it but then Love nobody's that. done it with mood swings and I thought well if there was ever a record that you would want to do that with it would be mood swings so um so yeah so I'm I'm gonna do that I think that is such a cool idea. If that happens, yeah. I'm, I'm on board yeah. 100%. I will be uh, ordering my, my copy. Look, I don't care what anyone says, and you've kind of you've, you've touched on it a little bit already. I don't care what anyone says. And I get teased. I've got pals in the YouTube community. We jump on each other's channels and stuff. And I get teased a lot for this. But in my opinion, grunge killed classic rock, in my opinion. Whereas bands coming up like you, you're saying you're two or three years behind, you didn't stand a chance to a degree because of the Seattle scene, let's call it. Now, I remember seeing an interview around the time of Mood Swings release. It's on YouTube. It's UNP sitting down, have, having an interview. And you said at the time of the Mood Swings release that it would be fake for you guys. Maybe it was Pete that said it. I think it was you or Pete. It would be fake for you guys to jump on that trend at that time. Was yeah. there ever a temptation to do it, though? Yeah, and, and you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't even say that um, it would be... I guess, you know, in the context of the first record or even mood swings, you know, there's still melodic records, even though they're musically way more interesting than was what was on the first one. But mm. um, here's the weird thing. And I've said this before. I go, we actually liked a lot of the grunge stuff, which is not a popular opinion if you are into <laughs> melodic rock. But I love Dallas and Chains because I like dark. I like heavy. But I love the musicianship as well. Like Lane Staley was a fucking phenomenal singer. Um, mm. Chris Cornell, I mean, come on, like incredible singer. I happen to like the pieces of music that are a bit more melodic, but I mean, some amazing talent came out of that as well. And it just, you know, for us, it was just like, you know, that's what voice of reason was of, you know, understanding what was going on, you know, the musical climate of the day, but we loved Metallica, for instance, like we loved the black Same. album. And so yeah. I go, I love queen. I love Metallica voice of reason to me was queen meets Metallica. Right. And it kind of went over a lot of people's heads and a lot of people didn't like it, but you know what? Every musician, that likes if a musician likes harem scarum that's their favorite record and i get it but the mainstream listener would just go i i don't get this it's too many twists and turns it's not not melodic enough and so the hard rock 
melodic community really, really hated that record. And I have friends that, you know, would become friends over the years, like Kieran Dargo. Everybody knows Kieran. He's just like, oh, that record is terrible. Fucking yeah. hate it. And I'm going, yeah, this one's for you. And I would dedicate a song to him live or somebody that I know hates it. I would do an on on uh, on stage dedication specifically to the people that hate it before we play it. It's just uh, just the way I like to do it. <laughs> I, I, I get you. Look, I think grunge was a, was a movement as much as it was anything else. You know, it was like punk. It was like, you know, and don't yeah. get me wrong. I don't, I don't hate Kirk Cobain. I don't hate Chris. I, I, I like all of Rock. You've touched on Don Henley. You've touched on Queen. You've touched on Metallica. Yeah. I love all of that stuff. I just feel the movement in its, in its short period kind of, knocked everything else back to the stone age to a degree and yeah i don't hate yeah. it i just i hate what it represented in terms of yeah. not letting my music come to the to the fore yeah i mean it's very true but you know since then i've heard you know arguments um of people in the you know melodic rock world or that had a lot of luck in the you know 70s or 80s and they say it kind of ran its course anyway and it could have been grunge or it could have been anything that come along. anything just yeah. anything could have come along and that was the end of it and I think once it started turning into the glam thing, like the poisons and, you know, then it was like, that's not Van Halen. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like the really cool Van Halen stuff or even the great journey stuff. And and even today, I, I will say like, we don't need another shitty version of journey, but it almost seems like there's a lot of people like just trying to write that same shitty journey song over and over again, great, write, great. The, write the great journey song over and over, or just once write a great journey song, not the shitty version of it. But we have a lot of people stuck in the mindset of this is what melodic rock is, but it's like, I say this to Pete all the time too, when we're writing songs, I go, nobody ever said it needs to be shitty. Right. Like, so yeah. why not, why not try and do night at the opera? Would anyone be offended by hearing a band attempt to do a night at the opera? Nobody would be, they would love it. Why are you doing the shitty journey song over and over again? Simple chord structures, same riff. Everyone's heard same lyrics. Everybody's used over and over again. Yeah. Go write Bohemian Rhapsody. Then if you're that good, you're just copying something that they liked 30 years ago. And for me, that's not exciting. That's not, it's not even good, you know? So make a great version of that. And I'm, I'm guilty of it. Like, I mean, I can honestly look at my work and just go out of every record. There's a couple songs that I think are good and the rest that just aren't, I mean, they're just not that great. So I just go, okay, that's cool. But that's me being very hard on, you know, that's the, being, the you being hyper and, harsh on yourself. I think you have to be, because if you fall in love with what you do, then, then, you know, there's no, there's no barrier to entry anymore. Everybody can participate. And in yes. a world where everybody can put their music up on Spotify and send you a link of their new shitty song, unless you're policing it, like nobody else will. Because like, to your point, your friends and your mother is going to, they're going to tell you you're awesome and your new <laughs> song is great. But you know, uh, you got to shoot a little bit higher than that. And back in the day, we wouldn't get any of those songs past an A&R guy, uh, past the marketing team, past your manager and all that. Those people don't exist anymore. So people right. are sitting in their basement working by themselves, even the other band members. You know, you're working on a song. Somebody works in the rehearsal room and goes, what's that? That's terrible. And you're like, OK, enough of that. Like, you don't even have that anymore. There's yeah. producers working by themselves on their computer and go, here's my new record and here's my new song. Yeah. No feedback. Nobody's specializing in what they do. You know, yeah. get get a great guitar player on your new track. You know, like, don't just try to do it yourself. There's a lot of great guitar players out there, but that would require interaction. It would require resources, money. And I get it. It's not there anymore. Like the industry has turned into what someone can do on their laptop that can do everything. And it's a little yeah. bit sad, but at the same time, people need to go outside of their comfort zone and get back to, you know, I think working a little harder on making the songs better. Well, talking about making the songs better as we, we'll, we'll come full circle, like we said at, at the outset, I mean, that, that new first signal song is incredible and I'm looking forward to the album. Right. So going into to 2023, I don't know if you know Robbie LeBlanc. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever come across Robbie. He does no, I know the name though. Yeah. I, I asked him the same question. He does the find me stuff. Could we see 
this kind of material live you play this live um i don't know at, at a melodic rock festival or maybe even doing a, a, a double bill with the likes of an fm or in the uk or something it, is it possible to see this you mean the live? first signal stuff or yeah the first signal stuff yeah um yeah i mean i would i would be open to doing it um it's just typically the challenges are even more challenging when it's not a name brand that people know it was tough enough for us to always get over to europe and asia as harem scarum yes right yeah and so you you go down a couple rungs in the ladder and it, it makes it very very difficult so you know but maybe if there were a situation where there was a house band or a band over in europe that you know we could do a couple of songs it wouldn't be too prohibitive with regards to timing money and effort um yeah you, you could definitely do that and you, you we would see that uh, at firefest and th- stuff like that you know like bands being put together for an artist to come over and they'd rehearse a couple shows uh re- rehearse a couple things for the show and you know i guess you could do that yeah i mean it wouldn't be out of the question i mean i'm i always say I've been saying this for 20, 30 years ago. We're game. We want to come over. We want to play. But when promoters get involved and you look at the expenses and everything, you can't just go out there for weeks on end and months and you, lose money. So that's that's really what it comes down to, unfortunately. You pick up the travel. You pick up the hotels. You pick up the flights and we'll give you some sort of receipt on the door kind of thing. Well, fuck that. That's right. Well, that's right. And even, you know, back in the day, we were flying with, you know, band members, road manager, sound man lighting guy first time we ever went to portugal uh first time harem scarum played in europe was uh in portugal and yeah like nine of us flying over there so you're probably at around you know eight to nine thousand dollars you know coming from canada for flights alone then yeah accommodation or you sing a note yeah line. yeah transportation and so to get a, a band like us over to europe and even now we just come it's just the band members going to make it cost effective and um and even then super challenging right yeah absolutely yeah and anything um you've kind of answered it already uh, but anything on the horizon for with pete for harem scarum into 2023 well, uh, yeah there's there's no plan right now um we've just left it open-ended that if if one of us gets inspired to sit down and work on a song that we call the other guy and say hey i've got an idea and our lives are really busy. We're, we're working on lots of different music for other people. Um, but then, look, we, we've always come back around to this at some point in our lives. But the older we get, the more skeptical I am of, you know, w- when and how that would happen. But uh, never say never. But, like, uh, we'd like to. We're just kind of lazy and... Uh, <laughs> and don't want to do the work right now and i mean right it's this way only because it's it it's six months of our lives and we and we take it seriously and that we just know what kind of a commitment it is because we've done it like 15 16 times before and it's just a, a huge chunk of our lives and a, a huge commitment so gotcha. we don't take it lightly gotcha last question and it comes from someone who's been with me for the start since i created this channel a loyal subscriber who was a big yeah. fan of yours his name's robert hansen and i said because you've been with me from the start and so kind to me, I'm going to give you one question for Harry Hess because he's a big fan. <laughs> so he wants to know if you could tour with any band in history, who would it be? Uh, it would have been Queen. Great answer. Yeah. Great answer. Yeah. And we actually did a bunch of dates with uh, Foreigner. So that would have been another big one for me. And it was at the time because I, I mentioned before, Lou Graham was a huge influence and it still is. Love it. Yeah, love that. Man, you are the voice of a generation for melodic rock fans. And from a from a big melodic rock fan, I want to thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Pleasure being here. Harry Hess, thanks for your time. Thank you.